NHL 25 is back for another year as we take a deep dive into the game with EA Sports Senior Game Design Director. Hey everyone, Rob Wong, pleased to be joined by Mike Inglehart, the Senior Game Design Director for EA Sports NHL 25 video game. And Mike, thanks for doing this. I've been playing this game since NHL PA 93, so I have definitely seen a lot of different versions of this game. But this year, it really does seem like you at EA Sports have taken this game to the next level. And for the first time, the NHL video game will not be available on last-gen consoles. What kind of doors did that open for you at EA when it came to making this year's game? Yeah, so being able to focus on one platform, uh, you can see a lot of that this year with our next-gen uh, uh, visuals that we have in the game, a lot of the work that we did in our characters. Uh, we can then just focus in on improving a lot of visual quality. So we've added uh, the most uh, likenesses we've ever added to a game this year in terms of player faces. Uh, we were able to actually finally attack the skeletons in the game. So previously we had one skeleton that was used across all facets of the game, including the women's game. And now we have two bespoke skeletons in the game to make sure that we have you know, just better representation of body types that are in there. That then unlocks things such as being able to finally drape the jersey over top of the skeleton and have uh, some cloth simulation on, on it. So when you've got guys like Matthews and McDavid flying down the wing, you can see the, the jersey animated the speed that they're skating at. Uh, allowed us to add in things like sweat spray on, on hits and then things like sn uh, snow accumulation on padding. So. Um, beyond that, too, I think an, an, another important thing to call out is by just having one platform to focus on, um, we don't have to deal with some of the one-off bugs that come between Gen 4 and Gen 5. So it allows us to focus on putting more overall quality in the game and just having a, a single target to go after. So a lot of benefits, and I think we'll continue to see those in the, the years ahead. All right, let's get into some of the new features, beginning with IceQ. You at EA Sports describe it as a logic-driven animation system. What exactly does that mean, and what kind of differences will gamers that have played recent versions of Child notice about the changes? Yeah, so logic-driven animation, it, it really just, uh, quite frankly, stands up for how it's described, which is animations are at the core of, of how a lot of these systems work. So um, the three different features below IceQ, the... Uh, Next-gen vision control and powered AI and reactive actions are all driven with that in mind. Um, I think the goal this year was to make the game, to be honest, just play more and feel more like hockey. Um, NHL 24 was a faster game. I think it was more of a track meet, a sprint up and down the ice. And what we wanted to do was slow the game down a little bit and, and really make it feel like you can command the ice, um, be able to live out those shifts where you're moving the puck around the defense, uh, the offensive zone, uh, cleaner breakouts, better movement through the neutral zone. And the combination of all three features have really played well together and, and the harmony of the new skating system, which really, I, I think it's the closest proxy we've had in the game. If, you, if people do play hockey or uh, you know, play beer league or anything. The way you skate on the ice, it's not simply in a north, south, east, west manner. There's a lot of small circles uh, that players uh, take on during the game. That extension is there now. The work with the AI has really allowed us to create consistency. Um, you know, if you play with a line over and over again, a lot of NHL players can make passes without even looking as to where their line mates are going to be. Our AI was a bit inconsistent in the past, and now that consistency is there. And then the reactive actions just allow the flow of, of the game to continue. Um, we've removed the nuisance of players bumping into each other, getting stuck on each other, and really trying to just create space out there. So the three elements really work well together. And uh, again, the feedback has been awesome out of the gate, and we're happy that people are feeling the difference and also feeling the, the stronger connection to the real sport. So skill-based one-timers are a big addition to this year's game and having played a bit of it already, I can say it's definitely one of the more satisfying parts of the game to be able to you know, send an absolute missile into the top corner like your uh, Alex Ovechkin or Steven Stamkos. I know last year's game, the one-timer wasn't as prominent and as prevalent. Did that go into your thinking about adding this feature this year? And what are the challenges of you know balancing a feature like this where you want users to be able to enjoy it, but not to the point where maybe it gets too repetitive? Yeah, so, I mean, the inspiration for the moment was, to your point, in modern hockey right now, I, I think the the equivalent of the skill-based one-timer is used prominently in the game, um, especially on, on special teams, power play. But, you know, two-on-ones, getting the puck off quick is always a, a really good rule to follow in hockey. Uh, we also wanted to create kind of our home run moment, if you will, uh, using baseball as a proxy. And, and these types of one-timers, they really bring fans to the edge of their seat inside the stadium or on the couch. There's either you know massive anticipation to a goal being scored or terrible dread of what might uh, 
uh, come off of, say, Austin Matthews' stick on the power play. And so creating some more emotional beats within the gameplay and having that heightened sense of of urgency was something we wanted to capture. Uh, we think we've nailed that. And then to your point, uh, how do you balance it? Well, we didn't want it to become the skill-based one-timer game. Um, and so uh, the idea was let's get it in, let's figure out a way that it's complementary. It is something you see far more on special teams uh, than five on five. Um, and just like we did last year, as, as we continue through, it is something we've, we've got feedback on or we're monitoring and looking at it. Um, as players get better at the game, if we need to make tweaks based on uh, how the game progresses over the cycle we will but we're happy with where it's landed we're you know really happy to hear people having fun and we think we've done uh, a good job of capturing uh, the moment in the real sport for for people on the sticks on the couch all right let's get into the most popular modes beginning with hockey ultimate team it's personally my favorite mode and this year you've added the battle pass uh, to it what played into that decision to feature that over maybe the traditional way of improving a hut team yeah, so the XP progression path, um, uh, we have a design council that we meet with that gives us feedback uh, from within the community. And the thought was, you know, trying to get all the rewards in the game, you, you were forced to play every mode and, and not every player wants to play every mode within Hockey Ultimate Team. Uh, some might want to focus on just purely the competitive. Some might not want to even dabble in competitive and they just want to play offline against AI controlled teams. And the idea is it should matter where you want to play. You should be able to get rewarded uh, in, in the same fashion. So with that feedback, we, we put all the rewards on a single path and then just gave the player the freedom to play the way they want to. So if you want to play everything, you're going to get rewarded. If you want to play a single thing, you're going to get rewarded. And I think that's, that's really the way that a game should shape up. The, the power should be in the player's hands as opposed to rules being set in place for uh, them to have to do things because you never want to do things that you have to. You should do things because you want to. Now, when it comes to uh, franchise mode, it is, of course, a, a staple of this game. I saw that no trades and uh, no moving clauses have been added to the game this year, which is uh, pretty cool for people who really like to take a, a deep dive uh, into that mode. What else can people expect from, from franchise mode in this year's game? Yeah, so it was a massive um, overhaul from the ground up. Uh, I think on the, on the base level, we changed a lot of the screen flows. We tried to make it all self-contained. There was a lot of uh, tabbing back and forth and, and a lot of slowness to the menus historically and finding things was not intuitive. So that was a massive uh, change just to kind of, you're gonna spend time in, in the menus. It's part of franchise mode, but I think the idea is to limit some of the pain and, and improve the quality of life there. Uh, you spoke about some of the uh, changes with no movement and no trade. Uh, contract negotiations were a new thing we put into the game this year. Uh, previously in franchise mode, if you wanted to ink a high profile UFA, it was pretty easy uh, to do that. Now you've got to go through the, the back and forth and kind of feel the, the pain and the challenge of what GMs go through. Um, you know, if you choose to lowball a player too long, they could just walk uh, what other players are interested in. We even have things such as tax considerations, depending on the province, country, or state that the uh, team you're, you're running is located in. And now when you actually land that high profile player, there's a lot of satisfaction because you've done it correctly. Equally, there's the pain that if you've played the game too long or they're just not interested in coming to say a small market team uh, that they'll go somewhere else. So the the game within the game for the purists who are looking for that fantasy from a GM perspective, a lot more of that stuff is uh, gone into the mode. And uh, we think it's now a, a great experience. And so far, the feedback really has been uh, awesome from players that, that uh, spend most of their time in franchise mode. Lastly, I wanted to get back to the uh, presentation to wrap this up. And, and you mentioned a lot of the new player models and uh, you even mentioned, you know, whether it's uh, snow and ice getting stuck on goalies pads. And I think I was playing uh, during the trial and I was like, wow, that's something I've never seen before. And it's just kind of a cool little wrinkle uh, for, for people that are, are hockey fans. It might not have a big impact, of course, but just, you know, visually, uh, it's really cool to see. I have to say uh, that, you know, if you're someone that's played this game the last few years, you know, you guys have, you know, continued to improve, whether it's uh, the menu or the visuals but when it comes to making those decisions year over year whether it's you know maybe a new score bug or, or new celebrations you know what is sort of the um, you know behind the scenes ideas that sort of you know lead to those decisions down the road for for next year's game or even this year's game uh, when it comes to how you want the game to, to look whether it's on the ice or off the ice even in the menus yeah I mean so there's a, a whole lot that goes goes into that and we do a lot of multi-year planning um, trying to uh, you know, sort of see where we want to go into the future. I'd say the community is definitely at the forefront of that. Um, listening to our players, I mean, this game is made for 
uh, our players. And so there's a lot of interaction that happens with the community throughout the cycle, uh, trying to figure out, say, what their top 10 most wanted things are, uh, areas that people would like to see addressed in the game. We also look at the real sport as well and try to figure out, okay, what are the areas where we can uh, increase authenticity, we can be more connected into what's there. Uh, even things like staying true to what's happening in real life, if a, a, a team will put in a new Jumbotron, making sure that that's represented in the game. And then from a design perspective, obviously with our product, um, looking at ways, we want to change the game year over year too. So trying to figure out with those two uh, first points in place, where are the opportunities for us to uh, improve the product, create something that's new. Obviously, hockey is still hockey at the end of the day, so the sport itself is never going to be uprooted uh, in the in the real world. But we have tons of opportunity to continue um, creating and blurring the lines, if you will, between the real sport and our game. So through the community, through looking at the real game, and then just trying to figure out how we can leverage those opportunities when the design is sort of a, a good high-level approach to how we make decisions on a year-by-year -year basis. All right, NHL 25 is out now for Xbox Series X and S and PS5. Mike, thanks for your time today. Yeah, thanks so much.